I know it's a crazy, silly question to ask that at this point in time, but, um, you know, no question is too dumb in here, right? No, sir. We have about two minutes until the meeting starts live. Thank you guys for tuning in. My name is Tim the Art. We've been scalping earlier today. There was a, there was a dip down earlier today, but then Bitcoin pulled everything back up, and we're still holding about 38K Bitcoin two minutes prior to this meeting, and Dogecoin is above 15 cents prior to this meeting. What's crazy is if they accumulate all this, sell it at a profit, and then we get up another bull run, they're just going to start it again, right? Sell all their Bitcoin, do the same thing again. I have a date tonight with uh, tradingview.com. What do you mean? I'm going to be making that video about charting and indicators tonight with tradingview. Really? Yeah. That's awesome, dude, because coming from you, I'm going to be able to fucking understand it. Because you talk plainly and you make sense. Thank you. And yes, my, my friend tried to explain it to you. She would be like, so it's going to be the mean average exponentially divided by the price. And you're going to add yesterday's price to today's price and keep adding. It's going to be too much work. Yeah. it's yeah. Yep. Yes, team, we highly appreciate that video of you doing the charting. Can't wait for you to put it out. Shit, Tim, I appreciate you so much. You fucking make us money. Money! Do I make you money, Steven? Hell yeah, dude. We get some YouTube hate comments where people lose money, so I don't know. You mean, no, because that's their own fault, because they did not listen to themselves and you. They took their only opinion from you or somebody they heard. Here we go. If I had listened to you the other day, I'd be up uh, two grand. Another right East Palm neutral. No what ifs. It's you take what people say, what works for you, and uh, write down the statistics percentage wise. You, you you helped me today, team. Uh, you check, saved check. me money and made me money at the same time with this damn Doge. <laughs> I didn't even see that death cross. Once team. Exactly. All right, we're I live. I'll tell you guys later. I'm sure. To achieving the monetary policy goals that Congress has given us maximum employment, and price stability. Today, in support of these goals, the Federal Open Market Committee kept its policy interest rate near zero and stated its expectation that an increase in this rate would soon be appropriate. The committee also agreed to continue reducing its net asset purchases on the schedule we announced in December, bring, bringing them to an end in early March. As I will explain, against a backdrop of elevated inflation and a strong labor market, our policy has been adapting to the evolving economic environment, and it will continue to do so. Economic activity expanded at a robust pace last year, reflecting progress on vaccinations and the reopening of the economy. Fiscal and monetary policy support and the healthy financial positions of households and businesses. Indeed, the economy has shown great strength and resilience in the face of the ongoing pandemic. The recent sharp rise in COVID cases associated with the Omicron variant will surely weigh on economic growth this quarter. High frequency indicators point to reduced spending in COVID sensitive sectors, such as travel and restaurants. And activity more broadly may also be affected as many workers are unable to report for work because of illness, quarantines, or caregiving needs. Fortunately, Health experts are finding that the Omicron variant has not been as virulent as previous strains of the virus, and they expect that cases will drop off rapidly. If the wave passes quickly, the economic effects should as well, and we would see a return to strong growth. That said, the implications for the economy remain uncertain, and we have not lost sight of the fact that for many afflicted individuals and families, and for the healthcare workers on the front lines, the virus continues to cause great hardship. The labor market has made remarkable progress <clears throat> and by many measures is very strong. Job gains have been solid in recent months, averaging 365,000 per month over the past three months. Over the past year, payroll employment has risen by 6.4 million jobs. The unemployment rate has declined sharply 
falling two percentage points over the past six months to reach 3.9% in December. The improvements in labor market conditions have been widespread, including for workers at the lower end of the wage distribution, as well as for African Americans and Hispanics. Labor demand remains historically strong. With constraints on labor supply, employers are having difficulties filling job openings, and wages are rising at their fastest pace in many years. While labor force participation has edged up, it remains subdued, in part reflecting the aging of the population and retirements. In addition, some who would otherwise would be seeking work report that they are out of the labor force because of factors related to the pandemic, including caregiving needs and ongoing concerns about the virus. The current wave of the virus may well prolong these effects. Over time, there are good reasons to expect some further improvements in participation and employment. Inflation remains well above our longer run goal of 2%. Supply and demand imbalances related to the pandemic and the reopening of the economy have continued to contribute to elevated levels of inflation. In particular, bottlenecks and supply constraints are limiting how quickly production can respond to higher demand in the near term. These problems have been larger and longer lasting than anticipated, exacerbated by waves of the virus. While the drivers of higher inflation have been predominantly connected to the dislocations caused by the pandemic, price increases have now spread to a broader range of goods and services. Wages have also risen briskly, and we are attentive to the risks that persistent real wage growth in excess of productivity could put upward pressure on inflation. Like most forecasters, we continue to expect inflation to decline over the course of the year. We understand that high inflation imposes significant hardship, especially on those least able to meet the high, higher costs of essentials like food, housing, and transportation. In addition, we believe that the best thing we can do to support continued labor market gains is to promote a long expansion, and that will require price stability. We're committed to our price stability goal. We will use our tools both to support the economy and a strong labor market and to prevent higher inflation from becoming entrenched. And we'll be watching carefully to see whether the economy is evolving in line with expectations. The Fed's monetary policy actions have been guided by our mandate to promote maximum employment and stable prices for the American people. As I noted, the committee left the target range for the federal funds rate unchanged and reaffirmed our plan announced in December to end asset purchases in early March. In light of the remarkable progress we've seen in the labor market and inflation that is well above our 2% longer run goal, the economy no longer needs sustained high levels of monetary policy support. That is why we are phasing out our asset purchases and why we expect it will soon be appropriate to raise the target range for the federal funds rate. Of course, the economic outlook remains highly uncertain. Making appropriate monetary policy in this environment requires humility, recognizing that the economy evolves in unexpected ways. We'll need to be nimble so that we can respond to the full range of plausible outcomes. With this in mind, we will remain attentive to risks, including the risk that high inflation is more persistent than expected, and are prepared to respond as appropriate to achieve our goals. To provide greater clarity about our approach for reducing the size of the Federal Reserve's balance sheet, today the committee issued a set of principles that will provide a foundation for our future decisions. These high-level principles clarify that the federal funds rate is our primary means of adjusting monetary policy and that reducing our balance sheet will occur after the process of raising interest rates has begun. Reductions will occur over time in a predictable manner primarily through adjustments to reinvestments so that securities roll off our balance sheet. Over time, we intend to hold securities in the amounts needed for our ample reserves operating framework, and in the longer run, we envision holding primarily Treasury securities. Our decisions to reduce our balance sheet will be guided by our maximum employment and price stability goals. In that regard, we will be prepared to adjust any of the details of our approach to balance sheet management in light of economic and financial developments. <clears throat> the committee has not made decisions regarding the specific timing, pace, or other details of shrinking the balance sheet, and we will discuss these matters in upcoming meetings 
and provide additional information at the appropriate time. To conclude, we understand that our actions affect communities, families, and businesses across the country. Everything we do is in service to our public mission. We at the Federal Reserve will do everything we can to achieve our maximum employment and price stability goals. Thank you. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. For the first question, we'll go to Chris Ruegaber at the Association of Press. Uh, th uh, thanks, Michelle, and thank you, uh, Chair Powell. Uh, so it's expected um, that the Fed will hike rates perhaps every other meeting, uh, but certainly in the past, the Fed has hiked at every meeting. So I just wanted to ask, you know, are rate hikes at consecutive meetings on the table? Woo! Year, pumping up right a live, here. A live meeting. And uh, on that note, um, would the Fed consider front-loading some of its rate hikes? Play the $25 uh, machine, man. Raise, or you can jump guys, on the table guys, or something. Pay. Thanks. Guys, we're so, pumping so a little bit as more. As I referred to in my uh, opening play, statement, play the, uh, it's, it is not possible to predict with uh, we'll much confidence exactly more. what path for our policy rate is going to prove appropriate. And so at this time, we, we haven't made any decisions about the path of policy. And I, I stress again, hey, machine, we'll you can actually guys, change nimble. like the, uh, we're going to have to like, like, cross like the amount on the machine. So you can be playing a penny, but at least play a dollar or something. Uh, you can, so what's the word I'm looking for? You guys uh, know? And, and I'll say, wait, 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 wait. We're, we're starting to pump again. He did not change fact, interest rates. We're going to be listening to incoming speech. data and the evolving People are already starting to buy up again. The spy is already jumping. We'll try to Look at the spy. The spy already did a cup and handle right here. Transparently, the spies already did a cup and handle. It already shot up four hundred and forty dollars on one minute. Place than it was when we began raising rates in two thousand fifteen. What's the Specifically, RSI? the economy is now much stronger. Uh, the labor market is far stronger. Inflation is running well above our two percent target, much higher than it was at that time. And these differences are likely to have important implications 55. for the appropriate pace of policy adjustments. Beyond that, we haven't made any decisions. All right, all right. We're looking pretty Thank you, bullish Mr. here. Victoria Guida, Politico. All right, go Politico. We're looking bullish. This is just the media Thanks press conference. Um, I wanted to ask, you were talking about the health of the labor market, and I'm curious whether you would characterize where we're so at then, right now as maximum employment. There was no meeting. And also, there was no plan um, along those same round lines, table meet. obviously, uh, rate hikes on the table so this now year. Do you think stream. that the Fed can raise rates, bring inflation under control without hurting jobs and wages? Sorry, just getting both uh, both parts of your question written down. Um, so, I would say, and this view is widely held on the committee, that both sides of the mandate are calling for us to move steadily away from the very highly accommodative policies we put in place during the challenging economic conditions that the economy faced earlier in the pandemic. And I, I would say that most FOMC participants agree that labor market conditions are consistent with maximum employment in the sense of the highest level of employment that is consistent with price stability. And that is that is my personal view. Um, and, and again, very broad support on the committee for the judgment that it will soon be appropriate to raise the target range uh, for the federal funds rate. The other thing is maximum employment will, will evolve over time and through the course of the business cycle. In the particular situation we're in now, it may well increase Max, the level of maximum of employment that's consistent with stable prices may increase, and we hope that it will as uh, more people come back into the labor market, as participation gradually rises. And the policy path that we're broadly contemplating would be supportive of that, come, that outcome as well. So uh, the thing about the labor market right now is that there are, there are many millions of, of more job openings than there are unemployed people. So you ask whether we can whether we can uh, uh, raise rates and and move to less accommodative and even tight financial conditions without hurting the labor market. I think there's quite a bit of room to raise interest rates without threatening the labor market. This is, by so many measures, a historically tight labor market. Uh, record levels of job openings uh, of quits. Wages are moving up at the highest uh, pace they have in decades. Um, uh, if you look at surveys um, of workers, they find jobs plentiful. Look at surveys of companies, they find workers scarce. And all of those readings are at levels, really, that we haven't seen in a long time, and in, in some cases, ever. So this is a very, very strong labor market. And my strong sense is that we can, we can, uh, we can move uh, rates up without 
uh, without having to, uh, you know, severely undermine it. I also would point out that there are there are other forces at work this year which should also help bring down inflation. We hope, including improvement on the supply side, which will ultimately come. Uh, the timing and pace of that are uncertain, and also fiscal policy is going to be. Uh, less supportive of, of growth this year, not of the level of economic activity, but the fiscal impulse to growth will be significantly lower. So there are multiple forces which should be working over the course of the year for inflation to come down. Uh, we, we do realize that the timing and pace of that are, are highly uncertain and that uh, inflation has persisted longer than we, um, than we thought. And of course, we're prepared to use our tools to assure that higher inflation does not become entrenched. Thank you. Let's go to Nick Timrose at the Wall Street Journal. Good afternoon, Chair Powell. Nick Timrose at the Wall Street Journal. Uh, I, I have a couple of questions on the balance sheet. The statement on the balance sheet today calls for significantly reducing your holdings. What does that mean? And then apart from moving sooner and faster to shrink the holdings, are there any other ways in which you and your colleagues are seriously thinking about recalibrate, recalibrating this process and, and finally, how much disagreement is there around how you should use this tool, including active sales rather than passive sales or changes in the composition of reinvestments? Thank you. So I'm afraid to tell you that those are all great questions and they're, they're questions that the committee is just turning to now. So we, we, had, we had a discussion, as you know, at the last meeting, an introductory discussion of the balance sheet and, and a teeing up of the issues at this meeting. We've uh, gone through and carefully put together a set of principles at a high level, and those are meant to guide the actual decisions we'll make about the pace and about all of the questions that you're, you're asking. And I expect that this process uh, will, will be something that we spend time our, on in coming meetings. I can't tell you how many, I can't tell you how long it will take, but, and then, you know, at the appropriate time, we'll provide additional information. So I did, f the last cycle when we, when we went through balance sheet issues, we did find that uh, over, a, over the course of two or three meetings, for example, we did come to interesting and better answers, we thought. So uh, we're just in that process now, and at the next meeting we'll be turning to, you know, more of the details that you're, that you're asking about. Um, I, I, I would say this, the balance sheet is, is much bigger. It's, it has a shorter uh, duration than the last time. And the economy is much stronger, and inflation is much higher. So, uh, and and I think that leads you to, and I sa I've said this, uh, being willing to move sooner than we did in, in the last time, and also perhaps faster. But be but beyond that, it's it's really it's really not appropriate for me to speculate exactly what that would be. And and I, but I would point you to principle number one, which is the committee views changes in the target rate for the federal funds rate as its primary means of adjusting the stance of monetary policy. So we do want the federal funds rate, we, 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 we want to operationalize that, and we want the balance sheet uh, to be declining in a predictable manner, uh, and we want it to be declining primarily by adjusting reinvestments. So if I could follow on that, raising rates and reducing the balance sheet both restrain the economy, both tighten monetary policy, how should we think about the relationship between the two? For example, how much passive runoff is equal to every quarter percentage point increase in your benchmark rate? So again, we 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 think of the balance sheet as as moving in a predictable manner, sort of in the background, and that the active tool meeting to meeting is not both of them. It's the federal funds rate. There there are rules of thumbs, I'm, I'm reluctant to land on one of them that, that equate this, and there's also an element of, of uncertainty around the balance sheet. I think we have a much better sense, frankly, of how rate increases affect uh, e financial conditions and hence economic conditions. Balance sheet uh, is, is a still a relatively new thing for, uh, for the markets and for us, so we're less certain about that. So again, our, I think our, the pattern we'll follow is to, is to arrive at a, a, you know, a timing and a pace and, and composition and all those things, and then announce that with advance notice, and and and, and it will uh, it will start in the background, and then we will we'll look to have that just running in the background, and have and have the interest rates again be the, be the active tool of, of monetary policy. That's that's at least the plan. I, I can't tell you much more about any of the any of the very good issues about size 
pace, composition, those sorts of things. So we'll be turning to all of those at coming meetings. Thank you. Thanks. Now we'll go to Neil Irwin. Uh, thank you, Chair Powell. It's Neil Irwin from Axios. Uh, glad to be back. Um, sir, I was wondering if uh, the volatility we've seen in financial markets in the last few weeks strikes you as anything uh, alarming or that might affect the trajectory of policy. Uh, conversely, to the degree that financial conditions have tightened some, uh, might that be desirable in some ways in achieving your, uh, your, your tightening goals? So, as you know, uh, the ultimate focus that we have is on the real economy, maximum employment and price stability, and financial conditions matter to the extent that they have implications for achieving the dual mandate. And you also know that we, we look at broader financial conditions, not one or two things, one or two markets. And, and what we're always asking ourselves is, are we seeing changes that are both persistent and material enough that uh, of a change in financial conditions that, that they are inconsistent with the achievement of our goal. So that's how we're looking at that. And um, I, I don't want to comment on today's financial conditions broadly, but we're not looking at any one market or, or so. So that, that's how we're thinking. In terms of um, what we've seen, I would say this. Uh, we, you know, we said uh, at our last meeting, we, we published a summary of economic projections, the median of which the median participant expected three rate increases this year. And, um, you know, it's uh, six weeks, seven weeks later now. And you have seen um, that our communication channel with the markets is working. Markets are, are now pricing in a number of rate increases. Um, uh, surveys show that uh, market participants are Ask expecting uh, a balance sheet runoff to begin, um, you know, at the appropriate time, sometime later this year, perhaps. We haven't made that decision yet. Uh, so we, we, we feel like the communications we have with market participants and with the general public are working and uh, that financial conditions are reflecting in advance the decisions that we make and monetary policy works significantly through expectations so um, that that in and of itself is appropriate thank you let's go to howard schneider um, you know for a year or uh, hi uh, thanks, Chair Powell. Howard Schneider with Reuters. So for a year now, the statements referenced the benchmarks for this initial interest rate increase. Now that we're approaching that moment, what are the benchmarks going to be for subsequent rate increases? I know you can't stipulate the path, but how should we think about the criteria for the next step and the next step? Well, you're right. We haven't got we haven't gotten to that point yet. We haven't made a decision yet, and we'll make that decision at the March meeting. Um, uh, we'll make a decision whether to raise uh, the federal funds rate. I, I would say that uh, the committee is, uh, is, is of a mind to, to, to raise the federal funds rate at the March meeting, assuming that uh, uh, conditions are appropriate for doing so. We have, we have our eyes on, on the risks, uh, particularly uh, around the world, uh, but uh, uh, we do expect some softening in the economy from Omicron, but we think that that should be temporary, and we think that uh, the economy should the underlying strength of the economy should, um, you know, should should show through uh, fairly quickly after that. If I could follow, uh, it, it, just on related question, the December steps had this copacetic uh, sort of set of circumstances where inflation comes down without the federal funds rate ever getting over the estimate of neutral. Uh, given developments since then, do you still think that's a credible narrative for the ultimate path of policy? I, the path is highly uncertain and that we're committed to using our tools to make sure that inflation, uh, high inflation that we're seeing does not become entrenched. Um, so a number of factors w would be, it, it's not just uh, monetary policy, uh, a number of factors are supporting a decline in, in inflation, as I mentioned. Fiscal policy will be will providing significantly less of an impulse to growth. We do expect this year, although uh, we do expect now that it will come slower than, than we had expected and hoped, that there will be relief on the supply side. So that, too, should, should lower these supply side barriers, which are a big part of the story why inflation is high. In addition, monetary policy will be becoming significantly less accommodative. So the question is, you know, we'll, we'll be asking this question all year long, and that will be, uh, are things turning out as we expect? There's a case that... Uh, for whatever reason, the economy slows more and inflation slows more than expected. We'll react to that. If instead we see inflation at a higher level or a more persistent level, then we'll react to that. 
And uh, again, we're we're well aware that this is a different economy than there, than existed during the last tightening cycle, and our policy is going to reflect those differences. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to Gina Smialik. All right, Gina, you go, Gina. Let's go to Gina. Calling Gina. Okay, let's go to Steve Leisman. I don't think Steve's here today. Thank you, uh, Mr. Clinton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have um, one sort of technical question and one question on principle. Um, the technical question is, if, if you're going to discuss balance sheet at the next upcoming meetings and you won't begin balance sheet reduction until after uh, you begin rate hikes, uh, it seems to technically mean that you won't or can't begin uh, balance sheet reduction until the summer. Is that correct? That's the first thing. Second of all, you suggested that that the um, uh, with balance sheet running in the background, uh, that you would possibly be raising rates and running off the balance sheet at the same time. That's sort of the technical question part of it. The, the, the principal question I have is you said it's going to be running in the background, but the statement on, on, on balance sheet principle says the committee is prepared to adjust any of the details of its approach um, based on economic and financial developments, which suggests there's something of a reaction function associated to the balance sheet and it won't be running in the background. So could you give us any uh, a sense of the discussion or staff presentation on what is the reaction function surrounding the balance sheet? Thanks. So let me let me let me start by talking about that last paragraph. So you'll remember during the last cycle that uh, this process of building up and then shrinking the balance sheet is a complicated one, and it, it involves inevitably surprises. And so during during the years during the prior cycle, we amended our balance sheet principles a number of times. Now we didn't intend to do that; it just it, events required us to do so. So we got a pretty robust paragraph there that says we're free to do this at any time. And, and it doesn't mean we're going to, but if the situation turns out to be different than we had thought, we're not going to be, we're not going to stick with something that isn't working. That, that's all that's saying. It's meant to be quite a general statement rather than a, a hint. So, I mean, I, I, I like to think that our, you know, our philosophy of the balance sheet is, is embodied in these principles. Um, uh, so, you know, the, the idea that, for example, the, the federal funds rate is the primary means of uh, adjusting the stance of policy that will use uh, determine the timing and pay, pace of reducing the size of the balance sheet to foster the dual mandate that will begin to reduce the size after we begin the process of uh, raising rates and on and on like that. I mean, that, those are all the things that, that try to describe uh, how we will proceed. But it may be at a higher level to try to get at your question. Um, you know, asset purchases were, were enormously important at the beginning of the re uh, recovery in terms of restoring market function, as they were at the, at right after the, uh, in the critical phase of the global financial crisis. And then after, they, they were a macroeconomic tool to support demand. And now the economy no longer needs this, uh, this highly accommodative policy that we put in place. So it's time to stop asset purchases first and then at the appropriate time start to shrink the balance sheet. Now the balance sheet is, is sub substantially larger than it needs to be. We have identified the end state as um, in amounts needed to implement monetary policy efficiently, effectively in the ample reserve regime. So there's a substantial amount of, uh, of uh, shrinkage in the balance sheet to be done. That's going to take some time. We want that process to be orderly and, and predictable. And um, uh, so those are some of the ways I would think this, this lays out our, um, you know, the way, we, the way we're thinking about this. In terms of the timing, I, I, I can't really help you. You know, it just says after, after we get underway. So we're, I would say we are, we're going to have another discussion at, at the next meeting. And I, my guess is we'll have at least one other discussion at, at the meeting after that. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll tell you as we make progress and uh, we'll, you know, we'll start the process of, uh, 
allowing runoff and shrinking the balance sheet at what we find to be the appropriate time. It's, I, I wish I could say more, but uh, honestly, we, we haven't made those decisions, and we actually haven't even re really had uh, the, the important discussions on a lot of the details that we will have at coming meetings. Thank you. Let's go to Craig Torres. Chair Powell. Uh, Chair Powell, uh, good afternoon, Michelle and Chair Powell. Craig Torres from Bloomberg. Um, Chair Powell, at the beginning of the conversation, you said risks are two sided. And I'm wondering if you can elaborate on what are the risks to the elusive soft landing? Is Fed policy a risk over tightening, or what are the risks? And then, second, Chair Powell, I have a quick administrative question. Um, you know, uh, Robert Kaplan's disclosure of his securities transactions. In, in a couple of months, Chair Powell, or maybe sooner, you and I will file our tax returns and we'll list transactions and all kinds of things. And next to those transactions, we'll put dates. And Bloomberg asked for the dates of Mr. Kaplan's transactions. The Dallas Fed is not giving us the dates. And I don't see why this is a matter for the um, uh, inspector general or anybody else. I mean, why can't he give us the dates? Will you help us get the dates of those transactions? Thanks. So, um you asked about the risks first. So, I, you know, the one risk is that inflation risks are still to the upside in the views of, of most uh, FOMC participants and certainly in my view as well. There's a risk that, uh, that the high inflation we're seeing will be prolonged and there's a risk that it will move even higher. So, uh, and we don't, we don't think that's the base case, but you ask what the risks are. And um, that's a, we have to be in a position with our monetary policy to address all of the plausible outcomes. And that calls for us to be in position. Um, we, we have an expectation about the way the economy is going to be evolved, but we've got to be in a position to, to, to address different outcomes, including the one where inflation remains higher. And, of course, that is a risk to the, to the, um, to the expansion. You know, w we've been saying and I, that... What we need here is another long expansion, which is the kind of thing we, we saw the, over the last, which is the record long expansion. We saw labor force participation rise. We saw wages uh, persistently higher for people at the lower end. And there, were, there really was no obvious imbalance in the economy that threatened that expansion. It could have gone on for years were it not hit by the pandemic. So we'd love to find a way to get back to that. That's going to require price stability, and that's going to require the Fed to tighten interest rate policy and do our part in getting inflation back down to our 2% goal. So I mentioned two-sided risks. Um, you know, a couple things. One, I'm a, the COVID is not over, and COVID can continue to uh, evolve, and it's just we, we have to accept that it's not over and the risks to it uh, can slow down growth. Uh, and that's, that would be, that's sort of a downside risk from a growth standpoint. I would point to, you know, it, it, another, another risk is um, uh, just further, further um, problems in the supply chains, which could slow down activity. And you, you see the situation in China as a situation there where that's, um, uh, their, their, their no COVID policy may cause more lockdowns is likely to and that may play into uh, may play into uh, more problems in supply chains in addition there there's what's going on in eastern europe and things like that so it, it, there's plenty of risk out there and uh we you know we we can't um we can't forget that there are risks on both sides so that's that's there that's what i would say um i know you've been all over this issue with uh with my colleagues craig on on the issue of of information we don't we don't have that information at the board, and uh, you know I hand I asked the inspector general to do an investigation, and uh, that is out of my hands. I am playing no role in it. I seek to play no role in it, and um, I, I don't I, I really I can't help you here today on the on this issue, and uh, I'm sorry I can't. Okay. Okay. Thank you. We'll go to Gina now. Hey, are you here Thanks today, for Gina? Thanks for taking Chair Powell, and uh, sorry for my tech issues. 
I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about where you're thinking on inflation stands today. You know, the last time we saw an SEP back in September, we saw that you you and your colleagues were projecting that inflation would sort of sink back down quite close to target by the end of the year. And I wonder if you still think that projection from December is a reasonable one. And if you're thinking it's changed at all, I wonder how you're thinking about that. And I also wonder if you could talk a little bit about the pathway to getting to that deceleration. Like, how do, how do we get from here, 7% CPI, to where you expect to be at the end of the year? So I'd say, um, you know, since since the December meeting, I would say that the inflation situation is uh, about the same, but probably slightly worse. I, I'd be inclined to uh, raise my own estimate of 2022 core PCE inflation. Let's just go with that um, by a few tenths today. But we're not writing, writing down an SCP at this meeting, but I think it's, it hasn't gotten better. It's probably gotten just, just a bit worse, and that's been the pattern. That's been the pattern. So, um... All right, so while we're watching this live, we can already see that the 10-year bond went from a 178 all the way up to 185, and it's starting to retrace. It's a little bit overbought. But on the hourly, look at this. Look at this. On the hourly... We have the uh, Golden Cross for the U.S. 10-year Treasury bonds. So this may be at a hint that inflation inflation may get lower as they raise the interest rate. So that's something to consider. Uh, crypto was a little bit bullish when this was bearish. Now this is turning a little bit bullish. And crypto is going a little bit bearish on the short term. U.S. 10-year Treasury. Part of this will be that we're us, the Fed moving away from a very highly accommodative uh, policy to a substantially less accommodative policy, and then over time to a policy that's not accommodative in time. I don't know when that will be. That's, those are the things that we're, that we're thinking about. That's, that's part of it. Um, another part of it is um, that fiscal policy provided a, an impulse to growth over the last two years. That impulse will be less. In fact, will be, will be negative this year. And so that's another thing. The other one is we will eventually get relief on the supply side. And, you know, the ports will be cleared up uh, and uh, there will be semiconductors and things like that. Now, what, what we're learning is it's just taking much longer. So I, th I think uh, longer than expected. And that, I think, does raise, raise the risk that, inf that high inflation will be more persistent. Um, I, I do think we'll come off of the highs that we saw in the in the early part of this episode in the in the spring last year. But really, what's the question is going to be what what is inflation running at? And so we'll be watching that. And I, you know, we our objective is to get inflation back down to two percent. It's also to provide enough support to keep the labor market healthy. The labor market is very very strong right now. Uh, and I think that that strength will continue. We, it, there, there's a there's really a shortage of workers. We see it, particularly among uh, production and uh, non-supervisory workers and, and people in the lowest quartile. You see very large wage increases. Uh, I mentioned some of the other indicators. So I think that's that's what we're looking at. And we're also you know we, we realize I think as everyone does that that this outlook is quite uncertain, and that we're going to have to adapt. Uh, and we're going to communicate as clearly as we can, uh, but we're going to have to be adaptable and, uh, um, you know, move move as appropriate. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to Colby Smith. Colby. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, Chair Powell, when you talk about being humble and nimble about the path forward for monetary policy, does that also include the possibility of raising interest rates by larger increments and say doing a 50 basis points hike at some point if inflation does not moderate sufficiently? And should we interpret this approach as a departure from the gradual pace that we saw during the last hiking cycle? So, as I mentioned, we, we have not made these decisions. We really haven't. And, and uh, what I can tell you now, though, is that we fully appreciate that uh, this is a different situation. Um, if, if you look back to where we were in 2015, 16, 17, 18, when we were raising rates, inflation was very close to 2%, even below 2%. Unemployment was, was not at our estimates of the natural uh, rate, and growth was, um, you know, in the 2 to 3% range. Right now, we have inflation running substantially above 2%, 2.5%. 
and, and you know, more persistently than we would like. We have growth even in, in forecasts, even in the somewhat reduced forecast for 2022, we still see growth higher than, substantially higher than what we estimate to be the potential uh, growth rate. And we see a labor market where, um, uh, by so many measures, it is historically tight. I think the, you know, the, in a way, the least tight aspect of it is, is looking at the unemployment rate, which is still below our, our median estimate of, of, of maximum employment. If you look at things like quits and job openings, as I mentioned earlier, and wages, you're seeing, a, and, and just the, the, the ratio of job openings to unemployed, you're seeing a very, very tight labor market. Now, we also know that uh, labor force participation is significantly lower. It's a percentage point and a half lower than it was in February of 2020. Maybe a percentage point of that is is retirements. Some part of those retirements are are you know, related to COVID rather than just regular retirement. So we think there's, there is a pool of people out there who could come back into the labor force, but it's not happening very quickly and it, it may not, it may continue to not happen very quickly as long as the pandemic is on. Um, so that's, that's, a, uh, that's, that's how we think about that. We, we haven't made, to your specific question, we really have not addressed those questions and we'll begin to address them as we, as we move into the March meeting and meetings after that. Let's go to Rachel. Thank you, Michelle, and thank you, Chair Powell, for taking our questions. I'm wondering if you can talk to us about any metrics that the Fed uses to assess how inflation affects different groups of Americans, especially lower, um, lower income earners. And are you worried that the Fed underestimates or can't effectively measure the impact of inflation on some of the most vulnerable households? Thank you. So it's, it's more a matter of, um, I think the problem that, that, we're, that we're talking about here is really that people are on fixed incomes who are living paycheck to paycheck. Um, they're spending most or all of, their, of, of what they're earning on food, gasoline, rent, heating, their, heating, things like that, basic necessities. And so inflation right away, right away forces people like that to make very difficult decisions. So th that's really the point. I, I, I don't, I'm not aware of, um, you know, inflation literally falling more on, on different uh, socioeconomic groups. It's, that's not the point. The point is some people are just really in, uh, in, in prone to suffer more. I mean, for people who are economically well off, inflation isn't good. It's bad. A high inflation is, is bad but they're gonna be able to continue to eat and keep their homes and, and drive their cars and things like that. It's more, so that, that's really how I think of it. And you know, we, we um, have to control inflation for the benefit of all Americans, uh, but part of, the, part of it is just that it's, it's particularly hard with, on people with fixed incomes and low incomes who spend most of their, uh, of their income on, on necessities uh, which are which are experiencing high inflation now. Thank you. Let's go to Edward Lawrence. Uh, thanks, Michelle, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, for taking the uh, question here. So, year over year, inflation's at a forty-year high. The input costs uh, for producer price index for all of twenty twenty-one was the highest on record. Some investors fear that the Fed might be moving too late. Um, now, you said no decisions were made on the path of rate hikes, but was a rate hike more than 25 basis points discussed today? And as a follow to that, because I have problems with the mute button, um, uh, as a follow to that, you testified that the supply chain issues could be worked out by the end of the year. You talked about that uh, today. The CEO of Ford, though, told Fox Business today that the chip shortage will last into 2023. So today you said inflation will start to ease this year. I want to drill down and get a timeline that you see as to when we could see that relief. Thank you. So I, I would not say that... I would expect the supply chain issues to be completely worked out by the end of this year. I do not expect them, and I have not expected them. Uh, what I would say, and I have been saying, is that I expect progress to be made uh, in the second half of this year, mainly. Progress, because we're, we're not making much progress. If you look at a ton of metrics, you can find some that suggest that delivery times are shorter and inventories in some industries moving up, but overall, we're not we're not making progress, and you know things like the semiconductor issue are going to they're going to be 
uh, quite a long time. I would think they'll go more than through to, uh, 2023. Um, in terms of uh, so, in terms of being too late, I would just say this: we, we our policy needs to be positioned to address the full range of plausible outcomes, as I said, and particularly the, the possibility that inflation will continue to run higher, more persistently than we'd expected. And uh, we think we are positioned to make the changes in our policy to do that, and and we're committed to doing that. And that that's that's really where we are. In terms of your 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 question about the, the the size of rate increases, we we haven't we haven't faced those decisions. We haven't made them. Uh, it isn't possible to sit down here today and, and tell you with any confidence what the what the precise path will be. Um, but in in as we work our way through meet this meeting by meeting, we are aware that this is a very different uh, different expansion. As I've said a couple times, with higher inflation, higher growth, a much stronger economy. And I think those differences uh, are likely to be reflected in, in uh, the policy that we implement. Thank you. Let's go to Mike McKee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd like to sort of weave some of the strands of your answers together and ask you, as you start to reverse policy, what your goal is. Are you going to be raising interest rates until you get inflation to 2%? Do you want to go below 2% so that on average you get a 2% inflation rate? And because you said uh, we have to protect the uh, employment part of your mandate, is there some sort of circuit breaker that would stop you from raising interest rates on the employment side? So, no, there's, no, there's nothing in our framework about having inflation run below 2%. So uh, that, that we would do that, try to achieve that outcome. So the answer to that is, is no. What we're trying to do is get inflation, keep inflation expectations well anchored at 2%. That, that's always the, the, the ultimate goal. And we do that in the service of having inflation. Uh, we, we get to that goal by having inflation average 2% over time. And if inflation doesn't average 2% over time, then it's not clear why inflation expectations would be anchored at 2%. So that, that's the way we think about that. Um, you know, it, it, what was the last part of your, of your question? I, I was asking if you're protecting the employment side of the mandate, whether uh, there's some sort of circuit breaker there. Nothing like that. I mean, I would say you have a tremendously strong uh, labor market, and you have growth this year at, at forecast to be well above uh, well above uh, potential. I mean, people are forecasting growth. If you think potential growth is around two, most forecasts are significantly above that for 2022, and that's even with uh, with um, uh, policy becoming substantially less accommodative. So the labor market's going to be strong for some time. We're, we ideally, what we're trying to achieve is inflation getting back down to two percent, uh, and we're trying to do that in a process that 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 it accomplish, it, it, you know, that, that will also leave the labor market in a very strong position. And no one really knows what that will take. I, again, I would say that it isn't just monetary policy that's helping inflation get down. It'll be supply side uh, improvements, and it'll be less less fiscal, you know, less fiscal impulse, in all likelihood. So, uh, but monetary policy will do our job. It is our job to get inflation down to two percent, and a situation where where the two goals are the two goals can be in tension is a difficult one. But but I, I I don't really think they are here though because I think a really significant threat to further strengthening in the labor market in the form of higher participation over time is high inflation, and also high inflation is taking away the benefits of some of these large wage increases that we're seeing now. So uh, we do hope to achieve, and, and our plan is to achieve both of those goals. Uh, if, I could follow, if I could follow up, um, does the danger of tightening too much uh, as policy works its way into the economy with a lag mean that you should go back to being more forecast dependent in making decisions rather than the state dependency you've been using as a framework for the last year and a half or so? State dependency was particularly around um, the, the thought that um, if we if we saw a very strong labor market, we would wait to see actual inflation, actual inflation, before we tightened. And so that was a very state dependent thought because for a long time we'd been tightening 
uh, on the expectation of high inflation, which never appeared. Uh, and that was the case for, for a number of years. So in this particular situation, we, we will be clearly monitoring incoming data as well as the evolving outlook. Let's go to Michael Derby. Uh, thank you for taking my question. Um, I want to ask you, with the benefit of hindsight, uh, and I realize, I mean, that is what it is, but uh, do you feel that, you know, monetary policy and fiscal policy maybe did too much to react to the crisis and that part of the inflation problem that we're having right now is because the government response, you know, collectively was more than what the economy ended up needing? So I think it's too soon to write that history, really. Uh, but I, what I would say is this. Um, the, if you remember what it felt like at the beginning of the pandemic, literally the global economy shutting down in large part, including our own economy and people going to their homes for weeks on end in masks and there are no vaccines and it could be a really long time to get them. You know, and then, and, you know, you have economic activity drops by a shocking amount in one quarter. So there, there was a real risk of lasting damage. And I think uh, Congress responded remarkably with the uh, with the CARES Act, incredibly timely, very powerful. People will all, there will always be flaws in these things, but in real time, uh, it was a remarkable achievement. And we responded, and what we were able to do was, you know, stave off a collapse of the financial system at the beginning and make time for what really needed to happen, which was the income replacement and then the recovery that Congress enabled with the CARES Act. So. Now that was a lot of, that was a lot. And what we did was a lot. And you know, now, so the, what we have now is we have the strongest recovery of any, any country and we have, uh, we have a recovery that looks completely unlike other recoveries that we've had because we've, we've put so much support behind the recovery. And we're managing the, the relatively high class problems that come with that, which are high inflation and a labor shortage. So, and these are serious problems, very serious problems that we, you know, we're working as hard as we can on. Um, was it too much? Again, I, I'm going to leave that to the historians. And uh, but, and it look, in 25 years, we'll look back at this incident, which will be a, you know, two, three, four, five year period, and we'll say, you know, we'll have a, we'll have a much better basis to make a judgment about the actions that people took. Um, but it was all founded, though, in a, in a very strong reaction to a, um, you know, to a unique historical event. And uh, I guess I'll have to leave it at that. I look for, I hope I, I hope I'll be around to see uh, how that looks in 25 years. Fair enough. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to Jean Young. Thanks, Michelle. Um, Chair Powell, some investors are expecting the yield curve could flatten or even invert after rate hikes begin. Um, would that worry you? And how important is that risk in the Fed's consideration for adjusting policy? So um, we, we do monitor the, the slope of the yield curve, but we don't control the slope of the yield curve. Um, many, fac many factors uh, influence longer term interest rates, but it is something that we watch and, and you will know that from uh, when we had this issue a few years ago. Um, and we take it into account uh, along with many other financial conditions as we try to assess the implications of all those conditions for the economic outlook. So that's, that's one thing I would say. Another is currently you've got uh, a slope, if you think about twos to tens, two, two-year treasury to ten-year treasury, I think that's around 75 basis points. That's well within the range of a normal, of a normal yield curve slope. Um, so it's something we're monitoring. Uh, we don't think of it as, I don't think of it as some kind of an iron law, but we do look at it and try to understand the implications and what it's telling us. And it's, but it's one of many things that we monitor. Can I follow up real quick and ask um, if, it, if it did invert, would you tie it to US fundamentals or would it be driven by um, a much broader set of factors? We have that's that's a good question in, in real time. Um, obviously, the U.S. long-term sovereign debt is a is an important uh, global asset, and it and uh, the fact that our rates are so much higher than than uh, other 
uh, risk-free sovereign rates around the world may put something of a ceiling on our on our rates. I don't know, but uh, it would really depend on the on the facts and circumstances at that time. Thank you. Let's go to Brian Chung for the last question. Hi, Chairman Powell. Brian Chung, Yahoo Finance. Uh, within the context of just the broad effort to normalize rates, would you describe what you want to do as a gradual hiking? And then secondly, within the context of hiking cycles, it's often the talking point for financial stability and wanting to make sure that uh, asset bubbles don't uh, merge. Is that something that has also factored into the conversation as you start to think about hiking rates? Thanks. I, I would describe what we're doing along these lines. This is going to be a year in which we move steadily away from the very highly accommodative monetary policy that we put in place to deal with the, with the economic effects of the pandemic. And that's going to involve a number of things. It's going to involve and it does involve finishing asset purchases. It's going to involve lifting off and it's going to involve additional rate increases as appropriate. And we, we have we're going to write down in March our next assessment of what that might be. It's going to continue to evolve as the data evolve. We need to be quite adaptable, I think, uh, in our understanding of this. The last thing we're going to do is we're going to um, have a couple more meetings, I think, to talk about uh, uh, allowing the balance sheet to begin to run off and um, do so in a predictable manner. And that, that's, that's something that we will also uh, be doing as appropriate. And I, I, I wouldn't, um, I don't think it's possible to say exactly how this is going to go. And uh, we're, we're going to need to be, as I've mentioned, nimble about this. And um, the economy is quite different this time. I've said this several times now. The economy is quite different. It's stronger. Inflation is higher. The labor market is much, much stronger than it was. And growth is above trend, even this year, uh, let alone last year. So. All of those things are going to go into our thinking as we make as we make monetary policy. And you asked about financials to have concerns uh, in connection with our policy. Was that your question? Um, um, yeah, within the context of other hiking cycles, it seems like uh, worries about asset bubbles emerging as a result yeah. of easy rates has been part of that. I didn't know if that was part of the discussion today. I, I, I would just say this. Um, we, we, of course, have a financial stability framework. And what it shows is um, a number of, of positive aspects of financial stability. But it, you, you mentioned, really, asset prices is one of the four. So asset prices, prices are somewhat elevated, and they reflect a high risk appetite and that sort of thing. I don't really think asset prices themselves represent a significant uh, threat to financial stability. And that's because households are in good shape financially than they have been. Businesses are in good shape financially. Defaults on business loans are low and that kind of thing. The banks are highly capitalized with high liquidity and quite resilient and strong. Uh, there are some concerns in, uh, in the non-bank financial sector or around, still around money market funds, although the SEC is making, uh, has made some very positive proposals there. And we also saw some things in the Treasury market during the, the acute phase of the crisis, which, which uh, we're looking at ways to address. But overall, the financial stability vulnerabilities are, are, are manageable, are manageable, I would say. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think they're going to wrap up the meeting now, guys. Yeah, he's getting a little bit thirsty. I could see it in his throat. All right. Well, so look, crypto and spy, GameStop, a lot of stuff was dipping during that Fed meeting. Um, the one thing that was rising, 10-year treasury bonds. Look at that. Look at those 10-year treasury bonds. Ah! 178 all the way up to like 1.83. Those are rising while crypto was dipping. I think that will knock a little bit of a chink off of our crypto run, but... We'll recover from that. That that was not a really bad speech. I was just trying to dodge around some of the questions and focus on lowering inflation. And he didn't talk about really raising interest rates. He talked about trying to fix the supply chain side. We're 
getting in the oversold range here for Doge. It's at 30 RSI on the hourly time frame. So that's why I pinged that 145 up here. 1445 actually. 1445. And I mentioned that we're going to start turning bullish again. The meeting's over. People not listening to it anymore. People are trying to digest what's going to happen in March. March isn't here yet. We're already, we're in January, so we have time. You guys are going to have a good Valentine's Day in February. We have time right now. So we have plenty of opportunity to bounce back up before March ever comes, before the Fed adjusts their balance sheet. It, it wasn't really great news in the meeting, but it wasn't bad news either. So there's not really too much to worry about at this moment in time just from that federal meeting. We're still bullish on crypto in long term. Look, Doge is already bouncing up from that 1445. Uh, the price is at 1458 now, so we're already bouncing back up. We had a bull flag earlier for Doge. We had very low oversold range before this happened. We had the golden cross for Doge on the hourly. We're looking bullish on crypto. There wasn't really, the only news that was there were people from news corporations asking j Powell questions. Other than that, it wasn't really much. It was like a lot of garbage. We're starting to be bullish again. The U.S. <laughs> Treasury bonds, 10 years are starting to go up as well. That's really good. The SPY was dipping during that meeting, but let's go to the 5-minute chart. The SPY already starting that small recovery as well on the 5-minute chart. So, look, I wish you guys could memorize these charts like I'm memorizing them and the patterns. So, we're going to make a nice little checklist. I want you guys to write this down. SPY and then Bitcoin and then Ethereum and then Dogecoin and then Shiba Inu, those five. They're going to move in that order generally. And they're going to be around similar RSIs and levels during those times. The SPY went down to 24 RSI. Dogecoin balanced down. It's at 36. Dogecoin RSI is 36, but it's already starting to bounce back up as the SPY is starting to bounce back up. Take a screenshot of this stream as well, and then uh, take a screenshot of this and play it back in about one year. You will see. But guys, uh, bullish on crypto, that was a pretty good meeting. Uh, right. I think I went on a 10 times long up here too. Let me double check. I know I use at least, yeah. Yep, I use 10 times long on Doge. And uh, Shiba Inu is already probably starting to bounce back up. Let me uh, go ahead and adjust my orders for that too. Oh, I already bought my SHIB as well during the dip. Uh, where did I buy my Shiba Inu? 2150, what's the current price? 2170. So not Shiba Inu is around the price I bought. I bought it 2150. It's at 2170. Not that bad. Bullish on crypto. I'm gonna go finish this essay, and I'm gonna go grab my dinner, and I'm gonna come back and try to work on that video for you guys later. And then uh, maybe if the night permits, we're gonna do a crypto after dark show in here. But yeah, please subscribe. I'm gonna go edit that video so.